you want to ask any question, you are most welcome. Does that mean, can I ask a question? Um, when I was younger, my mother told me about to practice concentration and repeating Radha Swami. And I mentioned this <clears throat> in a letter to you lately, and you replied that I should wait till I was initiated. And since then, um, it's been like totally irresistible to do it because it's the only way that I feel close to you. And um, I want to know why did you tell me not to do it and why then, after you told me not to do it, was it totally irresistible to me to do it? Hmm? Was it the pull so strong that I wanted to concentrate and just repeat Radha Swami after you told me not to? And by doing it, am I doing something wrong and angering you? So, sister, <clears throat> not a question of doing something wrong, but you must be convinced what you are doing. You must know why should you do what you are doing, what far you are doing. Unless you know the philosophy, the teaching, and no sense of following any teaching, first one should be intellectually satisfied what one is going to do, but what is the teaching, where it is going to lead me to, whether I am satisfied with it or not. I am satisfied with with the teaching, and I, and I just do it. Many things, many things come by maturity. Sometimes we are always influenced by mothers, parents, friends. We must rise above them personally I know. And, in, and individually satisfy ourselves. But I feel as if I have individually satisfied myself and I just... It's so that it's judgment you should leave it to the other to decide whether you have satisfied yourself or not, rather than to your own self. Okay. I'd like to ask a, a question concerning death, Master. Um, in our literature, death has been described as something worse than the sting of 10,000 scorpions, and another analogy has been of a silk cloth being torn from a, a thorn bush. Um, in the experiences of clinically dead people who have been subsequently revived, Death has often seemed to them to be almost a pleasant experience. Um, they describe perhaps um, seeing the body and leaving the body behind, but with no mention of pain, and also perhaps seeing the light at the long end of a tunnel. Those all deaths are sudden deaths, are by operations. Yes. Not this elderly deaths. That's right, yes. Then there's a difference. So death can be met in this body in a non-painful way. Yes, heart attack, finished. Yes. <laughs> so then the pain that we perhaps experience in meditation, for example, um, when we fight with the body and with the mind, that is not necessarily going to be fighting or warding off the time when we might diminish the, the sting of the scorpion. No, no, no. no. Yes. That is not the question. You see, sometimes mistakes try to exaggerate to frighten us. That if you don't attend to meditation, you may have to face like, like this. You may have to face death like this. Don't take them literally. Take them that death is a very painful thing. So if you go on practicing every day, it will become meaningless for you. You won't have to suffer that much. That is the only idea behind that. Because meditation is nothing but a rehearsal to die every day. So when we are doing the rehearsal every day, so death doesn't frighten us at all. Otherwise, the, the way they have tried to describe it, they are just, I mean, say, some sort of examples to explain us, nothing else. Thank you, Master. Do you want to ask something? Come near the mic. Come near the mic. 
isn't this the mic? Yeah. <laughs> well, I'm asking that really. <laughs> <laughs> um, um, Maharaji, um, I am a seeker, not a satsangi. Um, but sometimes... Sometimes when there is something really bothering me, I think about you. And then it seems like an answer appears out of nowhere. And it is usually the right answer, and I'm very happy with it. And what I'm wondering is, is that really you helping me, or is that just my imagination? How many books on Santmat you have read? Two and a half. Try to read all the books. <laughs> you see, that's more essential. If any question is left, after reading one book, the other book may help you. If still you are in some doubt, the other book will help you. And still the other book may help you, though it is the same thing talked about. Nothing new in any other book. Same thing talked in a different way by different authors. Or something, sometimes something clicks us, sometimes other things click us. Try, seekers should try to read all the available books, all the available literature, before they try to make their mind. And then if any question is left, the most welcome to write. Do you watch over seekers also, or just satsangis? Not really who watches us. There's always Lord above who watches us at every step. You must know the teaching, that's more important. Thank you. Yes, sister. Mm, maestro, que, ¿cuál debería ser el, el carácter de un sasangui? Uh, Maharaj, if you want to know which uh, should be the character of a satsangi. Which should be? A character of a satsangi. It should be character of a satsangi? Yeah, like what type of person should a satsangi be? I don't know what is the concept of a person at Sai, uh, what, uh, what quality of a person. I don't know. You see, man should have... Uh, we, we have many angles. As a human, we have so many angles. I don't know from what angle she is trying to... Assess a man. Hmm? What do you mean by characteristic of a Sasangi? You have to be clear in your question. You must clear your question. He has to play so many roles as a son, as a husband, as a wife, as a mother, as a citizen. Para que nuestra vida, carácter y conducta sirva de ejemplo a los demás. Uh, she wants to know uh, how a satsangi should be so she could help uh, other satsangis and other people. Unless we are able to help ourselves, we are hardly in a position to help anybody else. If we are satisfied that we have been able to help ourselves, then of course we are in a position to help others. Gracias. Maestro. Maharaji? Yes, please. Um, many of us come from countries that have large Sangats and we are uh, very active in the Sangat and do a lot of Seva. My question is, should we do the Seva a lot to us? Uh, many times I feel we are not capable of doing what is allotted to us in the sense that um, we are not perhaps doing it correctly. Should we just do it and leave it to the Lord? Which country you represent, Pedro? South Africa. Seva is always voluntary, sister. It is not something which is forced on you. Seva must come from within, from the heart, and do whatever you can, happily. And if you think it is some sort of a burden on you, you can request them to be relieved. 
I don't think it's a burden. I just feel sometimes they um, expect me to do things and I'm maybe not capable of doing it. That they know best and you know best. I don't come in. Thank you, Maharaji. Can I ask two questions on behalf of other people that ask me to? I'm sitting here for that purpose. Isn't it? First is that my mother wants to know about leather and leather shoes and leather bags and all that. Is it all right to use it or is it better to avoid it as much as possible? Sister, we have to live in this world. We are part of a chain in the society. We have to create some sort of line somewhere. After all, if you look from that point of view, you breathe, you kill, you drink, you kill, you walk, you kill. There's nothing where you don't kill. Fruits and vegetables are on your table. Don't know how many thousands insects have been killed before they are brought to you in the fields. You get milk on your table. God knows how, much, how many insects have been killed, which becomes the feed of those cattle. Anything, there's nothing, we do not live on dead, we live on the living. Even vegetables have life, plants have life. We can't escape from this creation, from killing. But mistakes tell us to collect the least possible load during span of your life. If you have just a weight of a shirt on your body, it hardly matters to you. But if you have a hundred pounds on your head, you are crushed under the weight. So this innocent weight on the body, you cannot avoid. Unfortunately, I am told in your countries, animals are killed for the sake of leather, but it is not in India. Probably we have too many cattle or even African countries, they don't kill them for that. They just die and their skin is used as leather. There's no harm in that. But still we have to somewhere draw a line. There's no harm in wearing shoes, even cloth, but you wear. You know, a farmer sprays on a cotton, cotton fields, then only this cotton comes. And in weaving, so many insects are killed. You can't wear them without killing. So how to avoid, to what extent to avoid, what to avoid in this creation? Water full with insects. No matter how much pure it may be. So you can't avoid killing at any step, you see. So we have to draw a line somewhere. We have to be practical in life. Tell her to wear shoes, there's no problem. <laughs> what about, the, I think it was a bag that you wanted to buy, a nice bag. Bag. Till yet she has never bought a bag. And this time she won my thumb impression for that. <laughs> um, the second question is that I met an Indian doctor. Her two sisters are Satangis, but she is not. But she's heard of, of your teaching and I don't know if she came to Satang or not, but she's seen a videotape and she's very impressed about the teaching, but still she thinks that she's... Uh, well, she thinks... Her question was that if one is doing good and is very attentive to his duty, which she is doing, she's teaching in medical school and she's uh, practicing medicine, and she thinks that uh, this is actually remembering God. And then, if she sits like in remembering God, which is meditation, she would be wasting time and energy. Uh, that time and energy she could use for uh, um, helping humanity. Sister, let her live with her teaching. Never let her live with her philosophy. Why worry you? 
Don't worry about anybody. Thank you. <coughs> Radha Swami, Master. May I share a light story with you and then ask you a question at the end of it? <laughs> I was As it suits you. Thank you. I used to be quite a heavy smoker for 20 years, smoking cigarettes. I was initiated, I was still smoking. And I was afraid to ask you, you know, if I should stop smoking or what you feel about it. And I got your book, Quest for Light, the one you wrote, wrote and I lit up a cigarette while I was reading it and I opened it up and right at the first letter, you said to some other satsangi that smoking is a dirty habit. And it was, I smoked it anyway and I continued to smoke. And I didn't want to write you, but do you still feel smoking is a dirty habit? You think by this time I must have changed my view? <laughs> no, Maharaji, no. Then what is the question? That was the question, Maharaji, and I just like you know I'm a non-smoker today. I'm glad. Radha Swami Master, during the process of meditation, when we are trying to pull our mi mind in and our mind goes out, and we pull it in and it still goes out, and uh, finally, occasionally, we enjoy some, with your grace, we enjoy some moments of bliss. Um, I wonder, do it, during those times, are these moments of bliss coming from our soul? In other words, is our, is our soul aware of the fact that it is going to meet the Master, or it is so much covered with the rust of karma that has no idea whatsoever what is happening during that process? Sister, meditation always makes us relax and we always feel happy in meditation because the concentration is here and the tendency and the attitude of the mind is upward, inward. So naturally we feel happy. When the tendency of the mind is downward and outward, we can never see happiness. It's always miserable. The moment we give our mind an opportunity or we try to pull our mind from outside to inside and upward, there's always a light of hope and happiness within our mind. That relaxes us. But but how about the soul? We know that is the mind that enjoys the meditation, but is the soul, soul aware? Soul is always full of love and devotion for the Father. Soul is not attached to this creation at all. Soul is not interested in anything of this creation. It's only the mind which is forcing the soul to its own level everywhere in this creation. So, during meditation, our soul knows and waits that it is going to meet the Lord or has no idea because it's covered with... Soul's, soul's tendency is always towards its own origin. So the soul knows? It is not interested at all about this creation, <laughs> about anything in this creation. It doesn't try to seek any happiness in this creation. Its goal is its own origin its own destination. This is the force of the mind which is, keeps it tied down to this creation, to the senses, to the world, to the all other faces and the objects of the world. So when there is attitude of the mind is inward, upward, naturally soul is relaxed, soul is happy. At least the sum weight is becoming less. Thank you, Master. Master, my question is about the mind as well. I've heard the mind described as, um, as how it can be our worst enemy and also how it can also be our best friend. And most of the time for me it seems more like an enemy. And I'm wondering, could you describe how the process by which 
mind becomes more of a friend than an enemy. By meditation, process is very simple but very difficult. You see, mystics tell us, mind is iron, and this Naam is philosopher's stone. Mind is also within the body, philosopher's stone is also within the body. Unless the philosopher's stone is in touch with the iron, it doesn't become gold. Same iron converts into gold when it is brought in touch with the philosopher's stone. You follow my point? So mind is the iron, Nam is the philosopher's stone. So with the grace of the Lord, by our Master's help, when we are able to bring the iron in touch with the philosopher's stone within, it becomes gold. The mind which was our enemy, it becomes our friend. Which was pulling us outward, downward, it starts pulling us upward, inward, towards our destination. So we have been able to win its friendship from its enmity. That's the only process. So by Simran and Dhyan, we have to withdraw our consciousness to the eye center and try to bring, bring it in touch with the Shabbat and Naam within. That is the only process. Thank you, Master. Master, I have a question for you. Um, if one is ill or injured and in great pain, um, is it a necessity to meditate for the two and a half hours at all cost? No. How can you? We must take a practical view of these things. You are traveling, how can you give two and a half an hour? I mean, this is generally what we want to do. What should be daily routine of our life? But naturally, you can't be so rigid about it. Thank you, Master. We shouldn't extend things to the extent that it becomes meaningless. <clears throat> Master, we're told to meditate and to do our Simran. And my question is, uh, why is the mind so good at doing its job of keeping me out of the eye center? And how, when will the mind realize that it's engaged in a useless battle and start cooperating? Well, sister, mind is a very faithful servant of its own master. So you should also be a faithful servant of your own master. Okay, thank you. Master, I'd like to just comment on what uh, the sister just asked you about. I mean, this is really uh, a fight between the mind and um, the soul. Uh, it seems to be quite a difficult fight. I was just initiated two weeks ago, and um, I'm becoming very aware of just how difficult it is to meditate. Uh, uh, I'm very nervous. <clears throat> I have one question um, concerning therapy and psychoanalysis. In the West, many of us uh, have undergone th therapy and psychoanalysis for help. Um, I had many emotional problems, uh, and so I, I seek therapy, and it helped me greatly. Now, I've, I've read that Nam is the cure for all ills, and I'm wondering if um, I could continue with some therapy, which I think uh, would facilitate um, <laughs> my success in meditation, because it seems to be a great, th there are certain things I have which seem to be a, a great block uh, for me. Brother, <coughs> the thing which is mentioned that Nam is a cure for all ills, don't think the bodily ills. If you are not here in this creation, your all problems are solved. So Nam is the remedy 
for all its when you are here ill illness is there problems are there anxieties are there when you are not here everything is gone along with you right so naam is something which takes you away from this world and makes you one with the lord from that point of view it's the remedy for all ills not that it's going to cure you of your all diseases you have to go through your own destiny so if it was in my destiny to seek help for certain emotional problems and if, if it is your destiny you will definitely have to go through it right and until that until i come in contact with nam um i i still would need to go through these things that i'm going through even after you have come in contact with nam you may have to go through all these remedies mhm but these remedies are for your body these remedies are not for your soul so the mind is part of the body maybe yeah <laughs> mind is playing in the body is part of me mind is what play playing with the body playing with the body ha uh-huh. aha uh-huh. you see many of our diseases concerns also the mind mental depression many diseases automatically go when our mind is cured blood pressure diabetic so many other things which concerns the mind worrying nature nervous natures so called depressions Well these are things that bother me greatly and it it causes me a lot of anger because I want to overcome them and uh, I want to I want to fight against them and achieve success so I'm willing to to do any practical healthy things which will enable me to to have success well consult your doctor also okay <laughs> thank you thank you I saw me master my question is about uh, god's play you said that this was all god's play that we're in and my question is about the nature of this play um i was wondering if it was like theater like a shakespeare play or if it was if this play was like a law court with strict protocol ah uh, it is like a law co- law court yes with strict protocol strict practical protocol strict protocol yes that is also a play i was just wondering uh about the play law court is not a play huh. it's not a play law court is no play but if it's part of the creation is hey, it part this? of the creation is okay but nobody call law court a play theatrical that of course theater is a play right but uh, court scenes are never known as play okay but where where uh, are the many scripts or is the one script hmm? are the many scripts in theater sometimes there are law courts yes. that can be part of the play is a part of theater in theater in cinema you see there are many law scenes court scenes yes, yes. they become the part of the play right and uh, is there is it one story or is it many what, different stories what what do you mean one story I was wondering whether uh, from down here it looks to us as though it's something very large and something that we're involved in. It's a very in. big play. Ha. Huh. Imagine the creation. Yes. <laughs> Imagine the actor and actresses. Yes. So naturally is a very big play beyond our imagination. Uh, but we all come together and we love and we die and we go through these things uh, common to all humanity. Whether we come together or not, whether huh. we remain separated from each other, but it's a very big play. Ha. Huh. Huge play. Okay. Uh, well, the director is only one. Ah uh, yes, that's true. I'll think of some more questions. Thank you. <laughs> well, Rajji, how can I prevent from being deceived by my own mind? Ask your conscience. our conscience always warns us that we are being deceived by our own mind 
And conscience also is the higher mind. Conscience also is a part of the mind. Well, what if, what if I, I've been, I know I've, I've thought um, in a way that's inappropriate, so I want to have the behavior and the thinking to be corrected. Then? I don't understand how conscience can tell me what I want to know. Conscience always warns us whether we listen to it or not. Someone from within always tells us whether we are, what are we doing is right or wrong, whether we care about it or not. So if I... But we are so much slave of the mind that it's a meaningless. We never listen to anybody. Even we never learn even from our past experiences. Nobody learns from even past experiences. We commit the same mistakes again and again, knowing wholly well that it is a mistake, what we are going to do. Mind is so powerful. The only way as the other just I discussed to make that iron gold, to make this mind friend, to bring in touch with the Shabdana and make it noble, purer. And let the soul dominate the mind, not the let mind dominate the soul. We have to reverse the whole process. Now senses are controlling the mind. Mind is controlling the soul. And by meditation we want the soul should control the mind and mind should control the senses. This whole process has to be reversed. So, in order to not be deceived by the mind, I just need to follow my conscience. Conscience, to some extent, always tells us right. But sometimes conscience becomes dead. Because we become so hard, hardened, by the mind, by not listening to the conscience, that it becomes dead. So if I listen to my conscience, then whatever my conclusion is correct? So attend to your meditation. This mind will become nobler and higher and better. That's the only way. Thank you. Uh, Master, I have a question about the Shabbat. Um, it's talked about that Shabbat manifests as light and sound, and it's the same thing. But in this world, sounds also have vibrations that you can feel. Is it possible to feel the Shabbat as a vibration in the body? Vibration in what sense? Like, so you can feel a sort of tingling or... Shabad has sound, so tingling is there. So it could be another way of... Um, should, if one feels this in meditation, should you um, concentrate on the uh, feeling, the ting the, that tingling? No, you have to be in touch with the sound. A sound has many types of sound we hear. Tingling is one of them in the beginning stages. I don't mean something you hear with the ears, but I mean yeah. a... Then what? Shaking. No. Like a mild shaking. No. Shaking is not a part of Shabbat. You see, some people feel shaky or have shaking sensations even at the time of meditation because 
sometimes we try to concentrate at the eye center tendency of this mind or soul becomes upward it wants to go upward but mind is so much attached to the senses shabd is trying to pull us upward mind is so much attached to the senses so we started shaking many times it happens so you better lean against some hard substance or sit on some comfortable chair or leave it for a couple of minutes and then again sit in meditation and even if the shaking doesn't make your body shake it just feels like you're still but you feel like a a sensation that um no that should be no sensation in the body no. okay thank you master thank you in spite of what you have told us a number of us are still concerned with spiritual progress and my questions are first of all should we pursue the path with the idea of making progress expecting progress secondly i'd like to know what spiritual progress is and thirdly i'd like to know if the soul makes progress on the inner planes without our knowledge and consciousness well brother we should feel concerned about the spiritual progress why not when we are sitting in meditation definitely we like to make spiritual progress and we should feel about the spiritual progress and when we sit in meditation we do make spiritual progress when we are trying to withdraw our consciousness slowly and slowly upwards towards the eye center that is making it a spiritual progress you see when a child takes birth it doesn't start running the next day it has to pass through so many phases before he can stand and start running so similarly before coming to be in touch with that shabad and making that spiritual progress within which is visible to us like the open sky we have to pass through so many phases and all those passing through those phases is also a spiritual progress can and does that happen without our knowledge or consciousness our awareness of it we may not see it but we are always aware and conscious of what is happening we may not see spiritual progress within much but we are always conscious and aware of that spiritual progress within because there's certain type of solace comfort peace happiness fragrance we do experience within ourselves basically which we can't describe but we do relish and enjoy another question i'd like to ask you along that line does spiritual progress have anything to do with what one sees or hears on the inside anything to do with that yeah is it related to that at all i'm not following your question does the fact that one uh, sees or hears something on the inside indicate that he is making spiritual progress certainly uh-huh. certainly yeah. thank you master um professor said that nothing in this world is permanent including the radha swami line after your body dies will the radha swami line continue just repeat your question again a little louder um i've heard the professor say that nothing in this world is permanent including the radha swami line what do you what do you mean by radha swami mind line i'm sorry in Ra- that there will be a perfect master in the world but not necessarily of the radha swami line of course every line has to come to an end sometime my question is will the line end after the body that you are in dies line comes you see line comes to an end when you see master doesn't nominate anybody in his place no line is permanent where is gurunanak house now where is kabir's house now where is dadu's house now where is palto's house now where is christ's house now every line comes to an end 
water at one place always stagnates it is not the property of one clan and one place or one community or one place Maharaj ji uh, <clears throat> what is the source of love in the world what do you mean by source of love is it from within us or is it from without of, of us see lord is love as christ said god is love and since our soul is the drop of the divine ocean so the soul is full with love for the dead lord so real love is in the soul for its own origin for the lord is a natural instinct in every soul towards its own origin and that is the real love this worldly love just fades away it's more or less a fatuation the real love love is that of soul and the lord Thank you, Maharaji. Master, um, I'm a seeker, and I wonder how can I express my heart song while I'm a seeker? Because I I don't have a meditation to do, and and <laughs> I would like to be able to express my my devotion and my sister it's not essential to express one's devotion it doesn't mean if we are full with love and devotion it has to be expressed somewhere the very fact we are full with love and devotion has its own reward has its own blessing it it has its his grace why lose its depth by expressing it no words can express it no language can express it there is an individual treasure why lose it by sharing it with others so so if if i didn't mean but can i just sit down in meditation even if i'm a seeker and and um uh, sister i always advise to the seekers that they should thoroughly study the santmat literature thoroughly study the philosophy of santmat the car they have to change their way of life not for a year or a two but whole of their life whole pattern of their life has to be changed and they must think and think and think before they take any decision they should not be influenced by any individual by any family member it must come from them within and if they have any question they should never hesitate to ask they should, they should never hesitate to write they must satisfy their intellect okay thank you and then they are building on a rock not on a sand they should not brush aside their intellect and follow any path they should never in be in a hurry okay. thank you and if they are satisfied they are always welcome yes okay. yes test yes master i have a question concerning free will and destiny and there's a prayer by uh, i think it's by saint francis it's called the serenity prayer and it says um god grant me the serenity to accept the things i cannot change the courage to change the things i can and the wisdom to know the difference and my question is how does one develop the the wisdom to know just exactly what we can or cannot change in our lives brother we cannot change our destiny at all nothing at all the effect of certain events may be minimized but you cannot eliminate those effects from your destiny uh then why why then does it say 
uh, the courage to change the things I can. Uh, what does that mean? He says we try to do our best to change our destiny, but give us the courage if we can't change it. For instance, if, if we have a bad habit, do we have the power to change that bad habit or is that... In How our... do you know that it's not in your destiny to change the bad habit? I don't know. Then? Why can't you take it your, that your, it is your destiny to change your bad, bad, bad habit? I see. Thank you, Master. You see, our destiny is interconnected. It is not independent events of life. One has to take a birth. One has to have a father, mother, may have sisters, friends, doctor, nurses, where you have to become sick and to be admitted, medicines, chemists, your admirers buying flowers, sending to you, sending cards to you of sympathy. These are all destiny where they, it has to play, play its own part. If one event is withdrawn from your destiny, what about that chain? It will break. What will the doctor do? What will the nurse do? What will the hospital do? What will the chemist do? What will that flower shop will do? It's all, our, all destiny is interconnected with each other. But its effect can be minimized. If one has to break one's legs, you may not feel the pain at all. But you cannot avoid breaking your leg if it is in your destiny. We can't change the events of our life. We can adjust to those events of life that they don't affect us. Yes, yes. Uh, Master, I'm a new initiate, uh, and I came from Texas, and this is the first time I've ever been here, and I want to thank you for bringing me here. Uh, I have a couple of questions. One of them is about meditation, and when I sometimes when I sit in meditation and I feel my body going numb, or I think the currents are going up, I get frightened. And I would like for you to visit with me about that for just a moment, because I don't exactly know what's happening. It doesn't happen all the time. Sister, first thing, you are most welcome. Naturally, in meditation, slowly and slowly we withdraw upward, so the lower portion starts becoming numb sometime. It's not essential that every time it has to become numb. There's nothing to feel frightened about it. Nothing will happen to our body. No damage will be done to our body. And there's nothing to feel frightened within, nothing to harm us within, because we are always sometimes frightened of something unknown. What are we going to face inside? What is going to happen inside? So that sometime unknown fear is there. But we shouldn't worry about it at all. We are never alone there. And there is nothing to harm us in any way. Because everything is very pleasant, what we are going to face and come in and touch. So we should sit absolutely relaxed in meditation rather with a happy attitude. May I ask, second yes. question? Yes. Uh, would you talk for just a moment about darshan? I understand my darshan with you and I came here to have to see you so that when I meditate then I will be able to visualize you in my mind. But is it also important for, like, to now you give me darshan? Is it your darshan to me or my darshan to you, or is it the same? Well, if you are looking at me, yeah. you are having darshan. If I am looking at you, I am having your darshan. <laughs> I'd rather have yours. <laughs> All right, that will be mutual. <laughs> you see, sometimes we have a very wrong concept of darshan, probably by looking at the master, we will have certain gains, certain advantages. We start calculating mathematically yeah. how much karmas we are able to wash by <laughs> 5 minutes darshan and 20 minutes darshan. You wash nothing. 
and by such type of darshan you gain nothing. Darshan is the helplessness of a disciple to look at his master. It is the state of a lover to look at the beloved. He never calculates. He doesn't bother what he is gaining or what he is losing. He is so absorbed with the love. He has no time to think. Lover never thinks what he is gaining or what he is losing. He is happy in his love. That is Darshan. Darshan is to create that love and devotion within us. So that that seed of love should grow within us. Lover always like to be in the company of the beloved. Something which forces us to be in the company of the beloved. Something which we can't help running to that, mm-hmm. coming to that. That is darshan. It is nothing mel- mathematical calculation, you see, yeah. which we start doing it. That is absolutely hopeless and meaningless. It does, it's not going to lead us anywhere at all. May I ask one more question? Yes, please. Uh, I've had some emotional feelings uh, um, between the time that I planned to come here and now that I'm here, and I, I would like to ask you to explain a little bit about being marked before birth and becoming an initiate. I, under, I feel like it is all your grace and that I have done nothing to deserve being to be an initiate. And I wonder if it is by random choice or... Why is it me and not somebody else? I'm very grateful. Sister, yes. this answer only the Lord can give it. Mm-hmm. None of us deserve to be on the path. Right. We know our past. We know our present. We know what we are. If we have to judge ourselves, or if we have to stand in judgment, we, don't, we, don't, we deserve nothing. It is he knows best why he has put us on the path. It is all his grace. So nobody comes on the path unless the marking is there by the Father. This is not in our hand, this is not in Master's hand. He is just to collect the marked sheep, allotted sheep. Those will automatically come around. Christ said they will they recognize his whistle and they will flock around him. He has only to give the whistle. And they are already marked for him and they will flock around him. If you start reasoning why I am here, why I have come, mm-hmm. what did I deserve, I should, I have not done anything, it will lead you nowhere. Every mistake says it is all in his hand. Unless he writes in our destiny, we can never seek the master. He seeks us. He pulls us. And the Lord knows best why. How? He has own ways and means. 